Okay, well, welcome uh, to my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas. In our ongoing sequence of uh, lectures today, we're going to be talking about municipal bonds. I think a lot of people get hung up because they think there's a zillion types of municipal bonds. Not true. There's only two. General obligation bonds backed by taxing authority and revenue bonds backed by fees. Now, uh, I wouldn't do it while I'm talking to you, but at some point I would recommend you take a sheet of paper and you fold it in half and on one side write all the terms associated with GO bonds. And on the other side of the sheet, all the terms associated with revenue bonds. Because a big part of your exam in this area is being able to contrast uh, GOs with revenues. Well, as we just said, general obligation bonds have taxing authority. You know, well, uh, they have the ability to confiscate money from others. You know, they're considered, I'm joking, but that's taxing authority, right? So they, unlike a corporation, do not have to deliver a product or service at excess of raw material or labor. They just need to send out the uh, tax bills. Now, on the state level, that's primarily going to be, it's going to be uh, income taxes and sales taxes. You know, not every state. I'm coming to you from Nevada, so... In Nevada, we don't have an income tax, but you know the assumption is that states, most states do, California, Illinois, New York, for example, uh, Florida, Nevada, uh, some do not. But for our purposes, test purposes, uh, taxing for, on the state level, the general budget, which you know is where the money is to pay interest in principal, comes from income and sales taxes. More importantly, uh, local government. You know, Oliver Window Home said taxes are the price you pay for civilization. So the more civilization you want, the more taxes you're going to have to pay. And political subdivisions are local government, cities, counties, you know, transit districts, school districts. There are 50,000 municipal issuers with over $4 trillion in debt outstanding. So there's a lot of them out there. 50 of those are states. That means 49,900 and, you know, uh, 50 cities and counties. I'm coming to you from a political subdivision called Las Vegas. Las Vegas is a political subdivision of Clark County. So Clark County is a political subdivision of Nevada. So that's what we mean, local government. And local governments are primarily financed through property taxes. Now be careful, your test is a giant reading uh, test. And so, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, that's a debenture. No, not unless it's an Inc incorporated, right? So a debenture is a corporate issuer. So here it's the full faith and credit of the municipality. They're promised to pay. And test question, voter approval is required. To issue a geo bond, the voters have to say, yeah, let's go ahead and do this. You know, I uh, used to have a mountain home in a little community called Mariposa. And Mariposa had proposed putting on the ballot a uh, issuance, the geo issuance of a, a school district bond to build the gymnasium for the high school. And they said, we think we can do it for two mills, two mills, not testable. A mill is 0 0.001 of my assessed valuation. So 0 0.002 would be two, uh, uh, 0 0.002 of my assessed valuation. If the assessed valuation is $500,000, they're asking me for another $1,000 in property taxes. Now, uh, that didn't pass and uh, oh well, right? We had a huge retirement community there in Mariposa and it went down in flames. So no gymnasium, no issuance of the bonds. Now, I think we might've had a better chance of getting the people to pass the bonds if we would have made them limited bonds. Limited means, you know, we think we can do it for two mills, but no more than three mills. So now they're saying a dean for no more if they're $1,500 in taxes. That means with the $1,500 in taxes, the three mills is insufficient. The bonds will default versus unlimited bonds. Unlimited bonds, hell or high water, whatever is necessary, that's what taxes will be uh, charged. Now, from a bondholder's perspective, from a bondholder's perspective, we would prefer that the bonds that we're holding are unlimited. In other words, now the municipality is saying is two mills doesn't get it done, three mills, four mills. You know, uh, Walt Disney, when he built Disneyland, uh, kind of blew it. He uh, said, you know, I got this 80 acres and it's in this political subdivision called Anaheim, which is in a political subdivision called Orange County. And even when he was building it, he knew it was going to be a problem. He wanted to build a Matterhorn. They said, we don't have a fake mountain in the code book. He said, well, I wouldn't expect you to have a fake mountain in the code book. And so if it's not in the code book, then you can't, uh, you know, build it. And Walt said, well, gee, what do you got that, uh, you know, is close? He said, gymnasium. He says, fine, I'm building a gymnasium that looks like a mountain. To this day in the Matterhorn, there is a basketball rim, you know, gymnasium. So Walt said, if I ever get the do-over again, 
I'm going to get my own political charter. As he went to the state of Florida, he said, I'm thinking about doing this thing called Disney World, but I don't want to be in the city of Orlando or the county of Orange. Been there, done that. I would like my own political charter. They gave it to him. It's called the Reedy Creek Improvement District. This drives Orlando and Orange County nuts because they'd love to put the city county limits around the park to get the property taxes. It makes sense that Disney is not going to charge it itself any more in property taxes than it needs to pay interest in principle on the infrastructure of the bonds of the park. And every once in a while they go to court and this gets hashed out and Disney says, hey, here's our political charter. You know, Developers say not a bad idea. They incorporate a city. They issue $300 million in the unlimited tax geo bonds. They sell 60 homes. The 60 homeowners are on the hook for the $300 million in unlimited geo bonds. They're being interviewed on television. They're saying that their property taxes are more than their monthly mortgage payments. They're talking about burning their homes for the insurance money. Probably not a good thing to be talking about on television, particularly if your insurance agent is uh, watching. Let me clean up the slide there for you. So, you know, what we'd like to see is a ability to raise taxes. We want the community to be both able and willing to pay back the borrowed funds. Now, I spent most of my career in San Francisco before I retired out here to Las Vegas. And San Francisco has very good credit quality. And one of the reasons they have very good credit quality in San Francisco is because there's a big gap between the assessed valuation of the properties and full estimated value. Now, uh, one of the ritzy areas of San Francisco is called Pack Heights, Pacific Heights. An older couple who bought their mansion many, many decades ago, paid $500,000, and they recently sold it to one of the guys from Silicon Valley for $10 million. You know, the property assessor says, welcome to the neighborhood. It's still three mills, but three mills, I'm just making up the three mills, three mills on 10 million is a hell of a lot more money than three mills on 500. So as those properties turn over, they have ability to raise more, uh, get more money. You know, Detroit had the opposite problem. It has, you know, assessed valuations that are higher than full estimated value. So there's not a whole lot. This will affect the credit quality of the issuer. So ad valorem is Latin for added value and that's property taxes. And we said property taxes are primarily what uh, finances uh, local government. Added value, right? That's what that means in Latin. Now, if we have community A, I don't know, it's community, I'll call it political subdivision A. Political uh, subdivision A. And we say the political subdivision A has a 95% collection ratio. And we say that political subdivision B these are cities has a 70% collection ratio. What we're saying there is that uh, only 5% of the property taxes in political subdivision A are delinquent. In political subdivision B, 30% of the taxes are delinquent. All things being equal, which they never are except on an exam, Political subdivision A has a better ability to pay back the uh, borrowed funds or willingness, I should say, because they actually have a higher collection ratio. Now, I'm not going to make you crunch that on the exam. We just want you to know that's a term that goes with general obligation bonds. So, you know, most of the time you see a ratio, you might get confused and say, oh, man, that goes to a, a revenue bond. No. That goes to a geo bond. Overlapping debt. Overlapping debt. When two or more taxing agencies, two or more taxing agencies, share some of the same geographic boundaries and are able to issue debt separately, They are said to be coterminous, living together. That's Latin for living together. You know, I am actually here in Clark County, Nevada, and uh, there's uh, overlapping debt between the debt that has been issued by Las Vegas and that's issued by the county. And, you know, they overlap some of their geographic boundaries. And again, it's again, in terms of making analysis. You know, how much of this debt are people responsible for? 
Uh, I'm in Las Vegas, and Las Vegas is 100% coterminous with Clark County. You cannot be in Clark County, Las Vegas, and not be in Clark County. Uh, Clark County is not 100% coterminous with Las Vegas. You can be in Henderson or Summerlin or somewhere else and not be in, uh, you know, uh, Las Vegas. So the county is not uh, coterminous with Las Vegas, but Las Vegas is coterminous. And the point here again is that as a resident of Las Vegas, there are people that are issuing bonds that I'm responsible for. There's people in Clark County, I'm responsible for a certain portion of that. Let me just draw you a picture here of what this looks like. So let's say that this is uh, my house right here. And uh, here's a school district. And here's a utility district. No, that's a fountain. And uh, here's a forest preserve district. And let's say this is the boundaries of the school district. Here's the boundaries of the utility district. Here's the boundaries of the forest preserve district. And here's a lucky guy who lives here. He gets to look at the trees, but he doesn't have to pay for the trees. So, you know, if I ask my real estate agent, how coterminous is the home I'm considering purchasing? I'm asking how many people can send me a property tax bill that I must, uh, you know, honor. You know, my place in Mariposa, uh, Mariposa's utility district wanted to put me in the utility district. I said, I don't need the utility district. I, I have a well. And they said, Dean, you're missing the point. We don't want you in the utility district because we plan on pumping water to your door. We want you in the utility district so we can give you an ad valorem assessed valuation of property tax that you have to pay. So again, we use that to make analysis of a GO bond. Debt limit. Some communities, some political subdivisions have a self-imposed debt limit and some do not. And again, the assumption is if it's a community that has a self-imposed debt limit, it's gonna be a better credit risk than a community that does not. Now I'm shocked that Puerto Rico was able to issue uh, $38 billion in GO bonds and nobody ever made them impose upon themselves some kind of a debt limit. So some communities have it, some communities don't. You know, very few employers anymore, very few employers anymore hand out defined benefit pension plans. Very few hand out defined benefit pension plans. And a defined benefit pension plan test question, the employer assumes the investment risk. You know, no doubt that uh, the public employer uh, retirement system of California, PERS, has hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars worth of investments because they need it, because you know they have to make good on the promises they've made. Now, if this was a corporate employer we were talking about, if it was a private pension plan, you'd be subject to what we call ERISA. You know, ERISA was passed in 1974, and ERISA stands for Every Ridiculous Idea Since Adam. No, I'm joking. It stands for the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. Now, there were two major crises in the pension plan arena. One was Sudebaker had a defined benefit plan and they uh, you know, had employees who retired. And for many, many years, they'd go to the mailbox every month and the check would be there. And then one month they went to the mailbox and the check was not there. Uh-oh, that's bad news. And the other bad news is the Teamsters kept lending their pension money to the mob. You know, part of Vegas here was financed with the Teamsters pension money. So we passed the Employee Retirement Income Security Act in 1974. And if you're a corporation, you're not allowed to have an unfunded pension liability. You know, under ERISA, you have to set aside X number of dollars and invest it so you can make good on the promise you've made. Now, uh, one of the few employers still handing out defined benefit pension plans are municipalities. You know, nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's the deal, right? We told those police officers and firefighters and city workers that, you know, if they work for the city or the county or the state for X number of years, when they retire, they're going to get a percentage of their base pay and health care for the rest of their life. But since they're not subject to ERISA, that means that uh, a lot of uh, municipalities have unfunded pension liabilities. You know, some do, some don't. Again, it would negatively impact their credit. You know, Standard & Poor has downgraded the credit quality of the city of Chicago from triple B to double B. That's important. Triple B to double B. So they were investment grade, but now they're not investment grade. And they said the reason that they were gonna downgrade their credit quality 
is because they had all kinds of unfunded pension liabilities, all kinds of retirees already of the city of Chicago, as well as future retirees, and they didn't have the money to make good on that. Uh, Arissa, remember, the point here is that maybe I should put that is municipal employers are exempt from that. It doesn't cover uh, municipalities, which means this could be a bigger problem. Oh, there we go. Uh, a double barrel bond, a double barrel bond has two promises, two pledges. You know, if you break into my home and I tell you that I have a double barrel shotgun, I'm promising you that if I miss you with the first shot, I'm going to get you with the second shot. And the first shot, first pledge is a user fee. And the second pledge is the full faith and credit of the municipality. You know, if I'm the municipal financial advisor for the city of Salt Lake, uh, Salt Lake City, Utah wanted to host the Olympics and they, uh, you know, were trying to raise some money to do so. And as a municipal financial advisor, I say, listen, uh, if you are going to go to the capital markets and tell investors that all you're pledging to pay interest in principles, the revenues from the Olympics, it's going to be a, a tough go to try and get these, uh, these monies raised because for every uh, host city of the Olympics that I can show you that's been a financial success, I can show you another city where it's been a financial disaster. And so what I would recommend is if we go to the market, the capital markets to raise the money that we make it a double barrel bond. If you bought these bonds on your confirmation, it would say Salt Lake City Olympic Organizing Committee revenue bonds, comma, a general obligation of the city of Salt Lake. Now, how would I test you on that? If I asked you to test you on this as type, you would tell me it's a geo bond. For example, did the residents, did the taxpayers of Salt Lake have to vote on the issuance of this bond? The answer is they most certainly did because there is stickiness to the taxpayers. 77% of them said yes. No wonder they were so hospitable, have a good time, spend a lot of money. Good news, at the end of the day, there was a money left over. There was a surplus. But if there had been a deficit, what would have happened to the property taxes of the residents, taxpayers of Salt Lake. It would have gone up by whatever mill rate was necessary to make good on the bonds, to make good on the interest in the principal. So if I ask you to classify this as to type on your exam, you would tell me it's a GO bond, it's a GO bond. Zero coupon bonds, also known as OIDs. Now remember, you're held accountable for three issuers of securities, corporate issuers of securities, municipal issuers of securities, and uh, US government issuers of securities. So whether the zero coupon bond, AKA the original issue discount bond is issued by a corporation, whether it's a treasury strip issued by the US government, whether it's a treasury receipt uh, where a broker dealer has carved it into as a bunch of zero coupon bonds, or what we're talking about now, a municipal issuer, and all of them test point, you gotta do straight line amortization upward called accretion. Now, what make, makes this one unique, if the municipal is the issuer, of this bond, you know, in the other examples where you have this or run into this concept in your, uh, you know, other issuers, that imputed interest you're receiving is taxable. But good news here, because the issuer here is a municipality, because the uh, issuer is a uh, municipality, the imputed interest is tax free, which is kind of cool. Uh, that's the only one that that would be true of. Uh, the other ones, remember, you'd be getting that imputed interest and you'd be paying taxes on money you're not actually receiving. You know, you'd have this fathom income, but you don't have that here when we're talking about the zero coming from a municipality because imputed interest is part of your tax free return. But yes, you still have to report it, which makes me think some type of day legislative risk. <laughs> they want to know who's got them. Uh, oh, well. Revenue bonds, no voter approval, no voter approval. You know, one of my favorite airports is uh, Denver International Airport. And uh, Denver International Airport replaced an airport called Stapleton. And one of my favorite guys, a uh, mayor at the time was Mayor Pena. And uh, Mayor Pena wanted to build this new airport. 
And so I'll play municipal financial advisor. He said, uh, Dean, do I have to ask my voters? Do I have to ask my voters about the issuance of these bonds? I say, no, Mayor, if we make this a revenue bond, no voter approval is necessary. So do you, Mayor, want a nice airport, a very nice airport, or the nicest airport in the free world? He goes, well, gee, if I don't have to ask my voters, let's, uh, let's go shoot for the top. User fees. If the user fees are insufficient, the bonds are going to default. That's very much a test issue. You know, I can't wait for the pandemic to be somewhat safer. I mean, I get my second shot here at the end of the month, and I can't wait to go to San Francisco and visit all my friends. I spend most of my career there and have a lot of restaurateurs and people in bars, and I'm going to do a legendary epic pub crawl and check in with everybody and add some fiscal stimulus. Um, one of my th favorite things I like about the airport at San Francisco is there's a big sign out front that says, your taxpayer dollars not at work. Your taxpayer dollars not at work. They're telling you, you're not paying for the airport. The people who are using the airport pay for the airport. If you don't use the airport, well, then you don't have to pay for it. Now, you know, when we issue revenue bonds, we're going on a feasibility study. Now, I've never met a feasibility consultant that tells somebody, the issuer, the municipal financial advisor, and the underwriter, that what they're considering is not feasible. You know, for example, in the Bay Area, they spent $30 million on a feasibility study about hosting the Olympics. After $30 million, does this guy say it's feasible or does he say it's not feasible? It's feasible. <laughs> All of shame. This guy was the number one guy on bonds that had defaulted. He said, I didn't say it would work. I just said it's feasible. Now, as a bondholder, I'd like to know about competitive facilities. You know, I would prefer that it's a monopoly facility. And my example of Denver International Airport, we promised the bondholders that we would destroy the old airport called Stapleton so that people would not have any other airport to fly to. Now, I don't know if I'm ever going to get to visit my friends at Schwab, but Schwab has a huge campus in Lone Tree, Colorado. And there's also an operation called USAA that's in Colorado Springs. And to be honest with you, there is a competitive airport because, you know, Lone Tree is about equidistant between DIA and Colorado Springs. And so, you know, that's a choice I have as a consumer that I can go there. Now, both of those airports, by the way, wouldn't be convenient if I'm on the other side of Denver, right? But the point here is, is there competitive facilities? You know, the uh, Warriors decided to build their stadium with private financing, but they had discussed using public financing. And they got as far as doing the feasibility study. And I was reading it, feasible, right? And it said the competitive facilities, they needed 140 events to make the economics play out. And 44 of those are Warrior games. That means they need 88 other, you know, stuffs, concerts and things like that, conventions. Um, and then the other problem was about 500 yards down the road, there's another competing venue, right? Where the uh, San Francisco Giants play AT&T Park. That's another place people could do concerts and do all that kind of stuff. Now, we're not going to make you crunch debt service coverage ratio on your exam, but you should know the debt service coverage ratio goes to a revenue bond. We said that's a big part of your exam is distinguishing between GOs and revenues. They love to torment you. They love to torment you on documents. So make sure you understand that we're talking about what's contained in the trust indenture not what's found in the official statement. The trust indenture is where we find the covenants, the written promises, the written promises. You know, that was, uh, covenant's a fancy word for promises. Between the issuer and the trustee, for the benefit of the bondholders. FBO, you should definitely know FBO means for the benefit of. So anytime you hear that uh, legal term FBO, that means for the benefit of. You know, you're lending money to a municipality and so you'd wanna make sure that you have a written set of promises. Let me get my picture out of the way there. And one thing that's found in the trust indenture, remember not the, the official statement is the prospectus like document. So that's a different document. So that's why I got that up there. Make sure in your own mind that you know what's what, right? We'll talk about that a little later, but flow funds. Uh, I would remind you too, this is the second ledger now, like lecture on munis. Uh, I have another one on underwriting. So I'm not gonna be talking about Eastern and Western and you know the components of a municipal spread. I have a whole lecture on that. Uh, very target rich. I highly recommend you go through that if you're a series seven. It's a little overkill if you're SIE, I wouldn't worry about it, but if you are, you know, uh, series seven, certainly check it out. So my point is I won't be doing that here. I won't be doing that here. That's done elsewhere. So uh, one important thing you get tested on is the flow of funds. And the flow of funds, uh, you would always assume net revenue. 
So on your exam, you always assume that when you're looking at one of these bonds, because that's the most common type. And we said one test question was, where do you find it? You find it in the uh, trust indenture. And if it's a net revenue pledge, they like to ask you which fund has priority, which fund has priority and the operations and maintenance fund has priority. Uh, I'll use San Francisco because I'm a, a little more familiar with that. Uh, the bank for uh, San Francisco is Bank of America. How convenient they have actually a branch of Bank of America at the airport. And at the airport, when they collect the money from the gate fees and from the, you know, uh, food court and the lease uh, parking structure and all that stuff, the first fund that goes into when they go to the Bank of America branch there is the operations and maintenance fund. And then once they have enough to operate and maintain the facility, then they'll start depositing or transferring money into debt service. Now on a gross revenue pledge, and this would be penny wise and pound foolish, it would be debt service would have priority. They would get you know enough money to pay the interest and principal on the bonds and then operations and maintenance. And as we said, you should assume on your exam You should assume on your exam uh, net revenue. Open versus close. Now be careful, open and close means different things in different contexts, right? I mean, open in mutual funds versus closed in funds or, you know, in a mortgage bond, open in fund means no priority provisions in a mortgage bond, closed in means there is priority provisions. And here, as we discuss munis, it means an entirely different thing. Open in bonds like San Francisco airport means the issuer can continually uh, sell new bonds as long as they meet the additional bonds test. So, you know, I go to my chief financial officer at uh, SFO and I say, hey, how are we looking on the additional bonds test? How are we looking on the additional bonds test? He said, well, then we promised debt service coverage ratio of two to one. We've, you know, we're, we're, you know, where we need to be. I said, well, how many bonds can I issue without uh, violating the additional bonds test? He said, we're good for 200, 300 million. I said, great. So I call my banker and I say, let's uh, roll, man. Let's, you know, uh, modernize, update, expand the facility to put in a new, uh, you know, landing field or whatever, new runway, uh, new parking structure, a new terminal, whatever the case may be. Now closed in, closed in bonds, closed in, let me get a different color here. Closed in, we can only issue new bonds if we needed to make the facility operational. I'll say more bonds. You know, my example of Denver International Airport, that was originally uh, budgeted uh, to come in at 500 million. So, you know, we sold $500 million worth of bonds, the airport's not open, so we not a problem. We just issue another 500 million. Uh, we still don't have it open, another 500 million, not a problem. We ended up doing four underwritings of 500 million for a total of 2 billion. Now that the airport is operational, no new bonds. So you can only issue in a closed end scenario bonds if you needed to make the facility operational. Now, if you wanna get rid of any of these promises that we're talking about in the trust indenture, just like if you've made promises, you wanna get rid of them, you can refinance, right? And if you don't like a promise you've made to your mortgage holder, you can certainly refinance and get rid of those promises. But that's what that means as it relates to immunities. Be careful. The Bellagio was completely financed with the issuance of mortgage bonds. And in that, it means a different thing. The Bellagio bonds, four underwritings of 500 million. Well, what a coincidence, DIA 2 billion and Bellagio 2 billion. Anyways, uh, there were four underwritings of 500 million a piece and there's no priority provision. So it doesn't matter if you bought the last bonds or the first bonds, it doesn't matter. Now, if it was a closed in mortgage bond scenario, we would have called the first mortgage bonds on the Bellagio, the A bonds, the B bonds, the C bonds, the D bonds, there would be priority. But here we're not talking about mortgage bonds. We're not talking about mutual funds. We're talking about municipalities and we're talking about revenue bonds. And if it's open in a revenue bond, that means as long as they meet their additional bonds test, they can issue more bonds. And closed end means an immunity bond, revenue bond, they can only do it to make the facility operational. Call provisions. Now for test purposes, 
The only bond that has no call uh, provisions is a zero coupon bond. So that's very testable. If my client wants to eliminate call risk, I would recommend to him a zero coupon bond because zero coupon bonds are not callable. Uh, most municipalities, most uh, corporations are gonna res reserve the right to replace their high cost debt with low cost debt. And so a call provision allows the issuer to call the bonds away from the bundle. What it allows them to do is replace high cost debt. Let me just give myself some more room here. Replace high cost debt with low cost debt. So one of the risks you have as a bondholder is what we call call risk. The risk that you may not be able to hold the bonds to maturity, you might only get to hold them to the call. And so very testable, we have what's called call risk. And call risk is associated with a declining interest rate environment. I always joke with you, if you want to sound smart and somebody asks you about, you know, economics, investments, finance, you say it has a lot to do with interest rates and you, you know, shut up, you sound pretty good. They say, what about them? You say, well, they fluctuate, <laughs> they fluctuate, right? So, well, that's one of the risks you have. And you do have what we call test question call protection. So, you know, there'd be a call protection consists of two things, call protection consists of two things, time and price. How long before the issuer can call the bonds and at what price can they call the bonds? So call protection consists of two things, time and price. So maybe I say the call protection period is five years. This bond can't be called for five years. And if they do call it, they have to give you 102, 102%. An extra, you know, 20 bucks is a prepayment penalty, if you will. So, you know, if this bond has call protection of five years, another bond has call protection of seven years, that bond would be uh, have better call protection. So the longer the time and the higher the call price, the better the call protection. And so we have what's called call protection, very testable. So you know, I say, Dean, what is the call protection period? I say it's five years, whatever it is, and what's the call price? And we said call risk is associated with declining interest rate environment. You don't have that. You don't have that risk in a, you know, uh, a, a uh, zero coupon bond. So uh, we also, some bonds have it, some bonds do not. Some bonds have a put provision and some bonds do not. You know, put provision is advantageous. So call break provisions are advantageous to the issuer in a declining interest rate environment. And put provisions are advantageous to the uh, bondholder in a rising interest rate environment. So you say, hey, Dean, this bond has a higher price and a lower yield than other bonds I've been looking at. I said, well, I'm not surprised about that. I mean, this bond has a nifty put provision. At the end of five years, you can put this back to the issuer. And that'd be a wonderful thing to be able to do, particularly if interest rates go up, right? Right now, we're at historic lows with interest rates. And you say, well, Dean, I'm afraid to lock in my money in this bond at you know, one or 2%. And so, you know, now sometimes the bond desk will actually add the put provision to make the bonds more marketable, not testable. But if they do it, they're going to have to go get a new QCIP to distinguish between which ones are and aren't. So put provisions are advantageous to bondholders in a, whoop, I can't say my bondholders in a rising interest rate environment. Looks like I'm off the side. So let's see if I can bring this up here. There we go. Put it over here. Let's get it over there. Boom. A 
catastrophe call. Now, we have what's called the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board. By way of reminder, we're talking about the trust indenture. And the catastrophe call is the only call provision that need not be disclosed to investors. It is found, it is found in the trust indenture, but it need not be disclosed to the investor. You know, I was teaching in San Francisco and I said, you know, we had this earthquake and, uh, you know, the Embarcadero tollway fell down and we said, man, that looks pretty without that. And so I call you and I say, hey, you know, your Embarcadero tollway bonds? You say, yeah. I said, we're using the catastrophe call. We're calling the bonds. We've decided we're going to build a nice promenade and put up some palm trees. And you said, well, Dean, you never told me about a catastrophe call. I said, well, you know, this negative energy. If you talk about natural disaster, it's act of God stuff. The MSRB does not require me to discuss with you a catastrophe call. If you were that interested, you could have found it in the trust indenture. So I have this guy in class. Well, that's why I don't live in California earthquakes. Well, I'm slightly. So where do you live? He goes, I live in Oklahoma. I said, well, gee, don't you guys have like, you know, tornadoes? <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> All right, I uh, wrote a potential test question here uh, because I told you I want you to know these various documents that uh, you get tested on, right? So which of the following documents contains the written promises or covenants for the benefit of the bondholders? Now, I left the trustee out of there because that would have been a kind of a giveaway, right? So which of the following documents contains the written promises or covenants for the benefit of the bondholders? It's not the official statement. Now, when they passed 33, 33 is the Prospectus Act, and they said, if you're going to sell brand new securities to the public, you have to give people a prospectus, you have to make a registration statement. And then, you know, the, uh, you know, U.S. government said, we need not do that. And then the municipality said, well, you don't have to do it, we don't have to do it. And so I tell the municipal issuer as their municipal financial advisor, I know you don't have to provide an official statement, but trust me, people have grown accustomed to it. And when I go to sell the bonds, people are going to say, can you send me something? You know, so I can make an informed decision. That's the official statement. So the MSRB can make us underwriters and municipal financial advisors provide it, but you know, they don't have any power over the, the uh, municipal issuer. Uh, P.S. It's the wrong answer here. That would have been the right answer if I said the prospectus like document. The legal opinion is done by the bond council. I had a guy in debrief here recently. He said he got asked about who pays the bond council to render the legal opinion, and that would be the issuer. And what the bond council was going to opine about is that they have the legislative authority to borrow the money. If it's a GO, for example, there was a vote that the uh, interest that they pay is federally tax exempt. We'll talk about that a little bit. And uh, that these uh, are exempt from 33. And the bond council is either gonna give us an unqualified opinion without reservations or a qualified opinion with reservations. Unqualified would be better. Uh, not the right answer here, not the right answer. Ding, ding, ding. The right answer here yeah, whoop, the right answer here is the trust indenture, right? Prospectus issues should, should know, don't go to munis, don't go to munis. Industrial development to revenue bonds. I think Mr. Boeing would be rolling in his grave if he knew that they moved the headquarters of Boeing out of Seattle. And before they moved the corporate headquarters out of Seattle, Boeing said, attention, Dallas, Denver, Chicago. We're going to come to one of your three cities. Now, why would they in advance say they're going to go to one of those three cities? You know, what are you going to do for Boeing? You know, the city of Chicago has an industrial development agency charged with luring employers into Chicago. And the city of Chicago's industrial development agency said to Boeing, have you given any thought to the corporate headquarters you'd like? And Boeing says, coincidentally, we have an architect rendering of the corporate headquarters campus building we'd like. Have you given any thought to the computers and training and furniture you're gonna need? Coincidentally, we have an inventory list of everything we'd like. Chicago says, if you will come to Chicago, we will build that corporate headquarters campus turnkey to your specifications ready to occupy. Wow. And then the interest in principle is going to be paid uh, through the lease payments that Boeing is gonna make. And that's our first test question. Our first test question is corporate credit backs the bonds. Corporate credit backs the bonds. How would I test you on that? Uh, let me try it. I just told you city of Chicago is double B and Boeing is single A. So are these bonds gonna be rated uh, double B or are they gonna be rated single A? They're gonna be single A. You know, um, Gilroy, California, single A credit quality 
issued these bonds to build a motorcycle manufacturing facility for a motorcycle company that was not rated. What goes on the bond? Not rated or single A, not rated. Corporate credit backs the bonds. Uh, I don't know if I'm ever going to get to see my friends in Schwab. I hope again someday. I haven't decided where I'm going to keep my ID access badge at Vanguard and Schwab and you know my friends at uh, Fidelity, but you know maybe I should just give up and toss them out. But that Lone Tree is financed this way. You know the city of Denver said to Schwab, "Hey, how about we build you a campus where 4,000 Schwabies can come to work every day in Lone Tree, Colorado?" And again, Lone Tree, Colorado's credit isn't on the bond; it's the Schwab's corporate credit is what's backing those bonds. Now, the second test question about this. In both these examples, it's a, not a, a essential here. What's being financed here is a private activity. In these examples, the major beneficiary of the bonds are Boeing or Schwab or whatever the case may be. So they're not financing like a high school or something like that. It's a private activity bond. Uh, by the way, it has implications because that means the tax, the interest is taxable to an investor subject to the AMT. The alternative minimum tax. So suitability question, before I recommend this to you, I'd say, are you subject to the AMT? Now the investor would know if they're subject to the alternative minimum tax. I mean, if they make it's about 200 grand, they start taking their deductions. You know, like my brother, we owe him 50 grand for being a citizen. No, we say, try it again using this alternative method. Uh, hold on just a sec here. I'm gonna close my window. It looks like we got a storm coming up here in Vegas, a lot of wind. We need the rain, so that's a good thing. It's a good thing. Anyways, uh, they will know whether they are subject to that, which it means if they're not, this might be a good value proposition because a lot of people shy away from these bonds because of what I just said. Now, there's another bond that has the same tax implications, and that's called a public purpose non-essential bond. You know, don't throw rocks at me, but that's a stadium, right? You know, we just built uh, the Raiders a new stadium here in Las Vegas and there was public financing involved. But you know, 50,000 of us uh, bonding over the Raiders losing another game is not like a high school, right? And that would have the same implications, it would have the same implications. Special tax, special tax, not a general tax that goes in the general budget, no, 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 a special tax. You know, sometimes this special tax might be on, for example, alcohol. Uh, it might be on tobacco. It could be a hotel. Uh, you know, uh, here in Vegas, we finance the uh, Raider Stadium with a special tax on hotels. It's about an average of $40 a night. So if you come visit Vegas, 40 bucks is going to pay the interest and principal on the uh, bonds we issued to build that new Raider, Raider facility. Well, you check out a New York line after line after line. You know, um, be careful. General tax, you know, Mariposa, 80% of Mariposa County, where I used to have a mountain place, is Yosemite National Park. And we have a big part of the general budget, general budget of the county comes from a general tax on hotels. That's not what we're talking about. It's a, not a general tax that goes in the general budget. It's a special tax. Sometimes we call these sin taxes against a particular product, uh, you know, an excise tax. So for example, Berkeley, it had a, a tax on soda water, two cents a liter. They issued some bonds to build, you know, playgrounds for kids. So, you know, uh, San Francisco has a general tax on alcohol sold within the city, brings in about 30 million. And Morgan Stanley as financial advisor to the city said, why don't you have a special tax on alcohol sold within the city above and beyond your general tax so you can issue some bonds to build an alcohol rehab center. So that would be the idea. Now, remember, we hope people don't stop sinning because if people stop drinking or smoking, then these bonds are going to default. You know, California recently issued $2 billion in Golden State tobacco bonds. They call them Golden State tobacco bonds because they want you to be very clear that this is not a general obligation of the state of California. You know, what's paying the interest in principle is the tax on tobacco products sold within the state. And those uh, taxes, that special tax on tobacco is insufficient. Everybody quit smoking, the bonds will default. Special assessment is against the benefited property.
you know, um, I took Highway 99 from my mountain place to my city place in San Francisco. And you go on Highway 99, you go north, you come to a fork in the freeway. And if you go right, you're going to Sacramento, you go left, you're going to San Francisco. And where that fork on the road, the you know, freeway is Highway 99. So it's a community called Ripon, California. And uh, Ripon, California decided to turn their community into a giant, giant flying J truck travel plaza. I'm joking, but you know, and the flying J truck travel plaza went to Caltrans, the Department of Transportation of California and said, we'd like you to revamp the freeway system. This is flying J truck travel plaza. So that it makes it easy for 18 wheelers to get in and off the freeway to come to our flying J. And Caltrans, the Department of Transportation of California said, we're gonna do that. They said, listen, we can't in good conscience ask the residents of California, the taxpayers to pay for this because you are the major beneficiary. So we're gonna sell some bonds. If you bought these bonds, they say Caltrans special assessment bonds, highway 99 off ramp 139. You know, so if I sell you the bonds, maybe I say, take a look at that. Because as the flying Jake truck travel plaza goes, so goes the bonds. So the special assessment is against the benefited property. And if the benefited property can't pay, well, then they go bankrupt. Could be a development. Maybe I've got 10,000 acres like wish here in Clark County. I'm gonna build a new, a new community called Coyote Springs. Uh, I'm gonna put it in uh, Summerlin. And they say, Dean, when you sell the homes, will you tell them they live within a special assessment district and besides the normal tax that everybody pays, they pay more. Now, again, remember if Coyote Springs doesn't come to fruition, there's no stickiness to the other taxpayers in Summerlin. It would just be the uh, you know, bondholders of the Coyote Springs development. Moral obligation bonds. Moral obligation bonds. You know, uh, if you get hurt in the park, I was telling you about Yosemite National Park, uh, they're gonna take you to the John C. Fremont Hospital, which is in uh, Mariposa, California. And not a whole lot of people actually know about the John C. Fremont uh, Hospital. You know, as I mentioned, you wouldn't know about it unless you, you know, had some troubles. Anyways, the uh, John C. Fremont Hospital wanted to issue some bonds, $10 million worth of bonds to modernize, update, and expand the facility. And, you know, outside of Mariposa, nobody's even heard of this thing. So they went to the state of California and said, will you be morally obligated to pay back these bonds? California said, yes. So if you bought these bonds, they say John C. Fremont Hospital Revenue District Bonds, comma, a moral obligation of the state of California. That's what will be on your confirmation. Very likely these bonds could default. Now, not a lot of people use this hospital. If they do, then they go to the state legislature and they take a vote. And they say all in favor of sequestering the money out of the general budget of California to pay back the bondholders say aye. All opposed say nay. More yeas than nays, you get paid back. More nays than yeas, the bonds default. That whole process I brought up is called legislative apportionment. So all you need to know is that's a term associated with moral obligation bonds. Now, surprisingly, they have a very good track record because before we take the vote, I say, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to point out the presence in the back of the room of the men and women from Fitch's and Moody's and White's and you know uh, Standard and Poor's. And they're here to see how the state of California performs on its moral obligation. And if we don't perform, they're gonna downgrade our credit and that will cost us way more in additional financing costs than it does to just pay back the bonds. So they probably have a pretty good record. Now I put PHAs in a different color and I didn't realize I'm using red here, but let me get a different color. You know, uh, I put them here because you know, the, the best credit quality possible, the best credit quality possible is that of the United States government. And there are three ways to avail yourself of that credit quality where you have no credit risk. The two risks in buying bonds are interest rate risk and credit risk. And one way you can avail yourself of the credit quality of the United States government is by direct obligations from the US Treasury, T-bills, T-notes, T-bonds. Another way you can get uh, full, full faith and credit of the US Treasury government is Ginnie Mays. And then this one test question is another way to get that. Public housing authority bonds or national housing authority bonds also have the full faith and credit of the United States government. Nothing better than that. Right? The US government can not only confiscate money, tax people, they can actually uh, print the stuff of which they owe you. So the doctor says, hey, Dean, I'm not sure I want to buy these low-income housing bonds. I say, you know, I like the tax-free interest I get on them, but boy, you know, what if the people can't pay their rent? I said, well, doctor, no worries. These uh, PHAs, these public housing authority bonds, 
these national housing authority bonds, test question, have the full faith and credit of the United States government. Raising money in advance of the legal call date. So, you know, maybe I come out of retirement here in, you know, Las Vegas, and I decide I'm going to do municipal finance. I'm going to be a municipal financial advisor. And so I uh, call Clark County and I say, hey, listen, I've been looking at your debt statement. And I see that on your debt statement, you have some 5% bonds outstanding. And as you know, right now, you could be uh, issuing bonds with 2%. And if, well, Dean, if you did your homework, you would see that those bonds have not passed their call protection period. So as much as we'd like to call those bonds, we can't. I say, I understand that. You know, what I recommend to you as your municipal financial advisor is why don't we right now issue some new bonds at today's 2%. We'll take the proceeds, we'll put it into a bank, an escrow account. We'll buy state and local government securities. And that way, when the bonds have passed their call protection period, we can call the bonds. Pretty cool. Let's switch chats here. I'm broker, your customer. I call you up and I say, hey, uh, I'm calling about those Clark County fives we've got. You go, Dean, I love those Clark County fives. Fives and bonds speak means 5%. You know, right now, munis are paying like two. This pays five. They haven't pay, pay, passed the call protection period. They can't make and give them back for another three years. I see. Yeah, that's all wonderful. But you know what they did is they uh, have raised some money and put it into escrow account. And you go, well, great. They owe me the money. They got the money. The bonds are AAA. I go, that's true. He said, well, why are you bothering me? I said, well, because you're not going to receive the yield to maturity. These bonds are going to be called. Once the bonds, the old bonds, the pre-refunded bonds have passed the call protection period, they will be called. They need to be quoted on the yield to call basis in the secondary market moving forward. And then, you know, we need to, uh, you know, uh, make sure that uh, we uh, understand that. Let's look at an example. So here's Clark County, Nevada. They issued 5% bonds four years ago. The bonds mature in 10 years and there's three years more of call protection. Today's rates are 2%. So they'd like to you know, refinance, but they haven't passed the call protection period. So what might the Assure Clark County do? Well, as we said, what they might do is issue some new bonds, right? So we're gonna issue these new bonds at 2% so we can call the bonds when they pass the call protection period. Remember, they're not callable here for another three years there in 2024. And so we're gonna put the proceeds from that into an escrow account, and those are slugs, state and local government securities. That's you know not testable, but we're not allowed to do what's called yield burning. I can't have a positive carry here. I got to raise the money at 2% and invest it at 2%. And uh, boy, good news, if they, if they have a debt limit, this is considered to fees. That's the fancy word for saying they can remove it from their debt statement because now they have a matching asset, right? So pretty cool. There's our 2%, our new bonds. And we said, that's the test question. That 5% bond is not going to mature. The 5% bond, the old bond is going to be called. And so it must be quoted on a yield to call basis. And that's what you're held accountable for. Almost always on your exam, by the way, if you have a choice that says yield to call, that's almost always the answer, right? Because that's the thing people you know, have troubles with. Credit enhancement. Some bonds do, some bonds don't. You know, when Detroit defaulted, when Detroit defaulted, you call me and say, Dean, did my Detroit bonds have credit enhancement? Were they insured? Some of the Detroit bonds were, some of them weren't. I say, yeah, good news. Your bonds were insured. So, you know, next date, you know, next interest payment date, you're going to get paid. You won't get paid by Detroit. You're going to get paid by this insurance company. You say, oh, that's great. What's the price? I go, whoa, very testable. I said, they don't insure the secondary price. All they insure is that they will continue to pay you the timely payment of your interest every six months and principal at maturity. Now, I would warn you that credit enhancement, that insurance is only as good as the insurance company, right? Uh, I doubt whether I should even show this to you because a lot of people get more questions wrong than they get right knowing about this. So, you know, this is called straight line amortization downward, and this is called decretion. We do this for muni bonds purchased at a premium. Muni bonds purchased at a premium. The IRS doesn't think you take your last buck and buy a muni bond. The IRS thinks that if you have muni bonds in your portfolio, that you have other things. That's that's typical, by the way. And if I go out to buy a block of 100 bonds at 120, woo, 120, 100 bonds, 120 grand, that must have a much higher than today's coupon. It must be paying way more than brand new munis. That's why it's trading at a premium. And the IRS thinks that what I'd like to do is uh, take that loss of 20 grand whenever in one fell swoop, whenever it's convenient for me. 
They say, you can't do that, Dean. If you uh, buy a mini bond at a premium, you have to do straight line amortization downward called decretion. So here's an investor who purchased a mini bond for 120 with 10 years to maturity. After holding the bond for six years, you sell for 110. Now, if you miss this completely, if you miss this completely, you're going to say, oh, I got an easy one. I bought the bond for 120%. I bought the bond of 120% uh, of par 120, 1200. I sold it for 110% of par 1100. I got a hundred dollar loss. And no, you have to say, okay, well, I bought this bond for 1200. And so I'm losing $200 over 10 years. And so each year on my return, I'm gonna have to write this thing down. So, you know, 1180, you know, what the IRS is making me do is take this in little itty bitty hits rather than one fell swoop. Now, if I've held this for six years, right? If I held this for six years and I'm supposed to be writing off 20 bucks, that means I should have adjusted my cost base here by 120 bucks. So my adjusted cost base is gonna be 1,080, 108. And then now I say, okay, well, if I sold it for 110, and it's 108, I actually have a recapture. I can't recapture 20 bucks. This is the right answer. Wow. Now that's a lot of work for one point. And this is about a 50-50 in terms of probability on your exam. About half the time I'm debriefing somebody, I say, hey, do you get the decretion thing? And they say yes. And other times they say no. Now, please note, however, you know, you don't want to give up practical application questions. You know, the three styles of questions on your exam are recognition, you know, when settlement T plus two. You know, practical application, current yield, you know, uh, break even an option, what we're doing now. There's no interpretation of what the right answer is. You don't want to give that up. You want to save your misses for judgment questions. Those are where you go, mm, you know, I don't know. Do I put that in? Do I take that out? All right. So let's go over this again. An investor purchased a municipal bond for 120 with 10 years to maturity. After holding the bond for six years, they sell for 110. What is the investor's game? So three-step process here. I say, okay, this is a mini bond purchased at a premium. So I have to do straight line amortization downward. I have to do straight line amortization downward. So I paid 120, that's $1,200. I'm losing $200 over 10 years. So I have to adjust it $20 a year. It's kind of like the first step of yield to maturity. Uh, I've held it for six years. So I should have adjusted my cost base down to 120. I sell it at 108. That's my adjusted cost base. And then I sell and I got a gain of 20 bucks. Uh, may see it, may not see it on your exam. The number one reason people buy muni bonds is because the interest is tax-free. Now, early on in American history, we had a bank authorized by Congress, the Bank of the United States of America, and the state of Maryland hated it. And they went to McCullough, the bank branch manager, and they said, you owe $10 million in state income tax. And he said, I think it's debatable whether you can tax the federal government in the conduct of its business. They sent the National Guard in, they yanked $10 million out of the vault. In a very famous Supreme Court case, McCullough versus Maryland, Chief Justice John Marshall said the ability to tax is the ability to destroy. And we can't have you states interfering with us, the federal government in the conduct of our business. But if you don't bother us, we won't bother you. You leave us alone, we'll leave you alone. Now, hard to believe we ran the country till 1918 without an income tax, but you know, uh, this comes from constitutional law. The RISA, remember, reciprocity. The government doesn't have to comply. Meanings don't have to comply, right? Um, uh, anything, Prospectus Act 33, they don't have to comply, right? So the interest that you receive in a mini bond is federally tax exempt. Now, suitability, state and local depends on where you live and what kind of bond you're going to buy. Reciprocity doesn't apply state to state. So if I'm talking to you and you, you live in California, I say, you know, listen, uh, why don't you give me uh, you know, you just sold your business for how much? Give me, you know, how about a hundred million to build you a muni bond portfolio? Get you some tax-free interest, you know? And I'm going to buy you California or political subdivisions of California. You say, well, Dean, I'm actually moving to New York City. I go, ooh, say it ain't so. New York City has a city income tax and New York City can and will tax you on California debt. New York State has a state income tax. They can and will tax you. So, and it could be triple exempt or double exempt there's not many cities with an income tax, but Philadelphia has a city income tax. Uh, New York City has a city income tax. Uh, you know, and then we said the vast majority of states have income taxes. Uh, Texas doesn't, Nevada doesn't, but for tested good purposes, we assume it's a, an income tax. Anyways, 
Um, yours truly, right? I got a nice pay raise when I moved to Nevada, right? <laughs> Anyways, you say, well, Dean, is there anywhere, any bonds I can buy that no matter where I'm at in the United States of America, uh, my bonds would be exempt at every level? I say, yes, territories of the United States government. Now, they're not going to give you U.S. Micronesia or U.S. Uh, Virgin Islands or, you know, uh, American Samoa, but guaranteed to give you Puerto Rico, right? If anybody wants Puerto Rico to vote to become a state, it's the other states. Because if Puerto Rico becomes a state, then the other states could tax you on the interest you're receiving on Puerto Rican debt. So that's the one they want, one on your exam. Are we clear Alaska, Hawaii are not territories of the United States government, <laughs> right? So here's an example of a customer who's in a 40% tax bracket. I said, oh, you're pretty blessed. The more blessed you are, the higher the tax bracket you're in. And so if you get a 6% corporate bond, that's $60 in interest, right? 6% based on par. And 40% of that means you're gonna give 24 bucks back to the US government. That's the price you pay for a civilization. And so you now are net left with 36. Now in the muni bond, there is no taxes, but at the end of the day, you're still better off. You're still better off with the uh, corporate bond because even after paying your taxes, you net more money. Now, listen, ladies and gentlemen, anytime you can do math and get a suitability question, right? Boy, you want to embrace that. And so please note here, boy, you definitely want to be able to do this math. You know, I haven't said this very often, but there's some math on your test that you can't be fumbling around with. You know, you can't be fumbling around with how to calculate parity, for example, in a convertible. And you can't be fumbling around here. Now, in an earlier lecture, we had looked at Ford Motor Company bonds and they had an 8% taxable yield. And so what we're trying to figure out here is what is 8% taxable equivalent to getting tax-free after you pay your taxes. Now, as we said, you're in a 40% tax bracket. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to take 8% times 100 minus your tax bracket. Let me get my calculator here. And I say, in your tax bracket, getting eight and paying taxes is the equivalent of getting 4.8. The point being, again, if we can find a muni paying five, maybe you should do that. You know, uh, again, Ford Motor Company is double B credits, so all things being equal, which they never are, whatever that is. But I would certainly say, boy, you better memorize that. Now, the other version of this is to go the other way. Here, we're starting with the taxable yield and figuring out what the tax-free equivalent is. Here, we're starting with the tax-free and going the other way. So here, maybe we're considering purchasing a 3% uh, muni. So we take the tax-free yield, and again, we divide by 100% minus the tax bracket. You know, in terms of uh, order of operations, remember this from school, you always do the parentheses first, and so now we take 3%, and we divide by 0.60, and I say getting a 3% not paying taxes is the equivalent of getting 5% taxable. Right, that's what that means, right? Getting eight is the equivalent of getting 4.8 tax-free. Uh, both those formulas you should memorize and you should be able to perform on, on your exam. That is very testable. Listen, if the MSRB says it's a municipal security, it's a municipal security, right? So. Uh, I haven't had anybody on Series 7 tell me they've seen this, but it does come up quite a bit on your SIE. So if you're an SIE candidate, uh, I've had all kinds of people tell me that they get uh, tested on this idea that there are no income restrictions and restrictions on a 529, and there are no contribution limits on a 529. Now, remember, the different issue is the gift tax. Now, I think of the gift tax as the estate tax in advance, and to keep you from dissipating your estate and not having uh, anything left for the IRS to get their hands on, we say if you give people more than 15 grand, they don't test on numbers that change like that, but it's 15. You know, past 15, you're gonna have a gift tax. You're allowed to front load these things for five years, which is wonderful. You know, President Obama was being interviewed, president at the time, the girls were still uh, minors. 
He said, have you, he's five twenty nines. He said, you know, you can front load these things for five years. He said, I put five times 15 times two. That's 150 for my daughters. And then Michelle did the same thing. Five years times 15 times two, two daughters. We were able to take $300,000 out of our estate. <laughs> then he said, you know, maybe we should means test this. Uh, <laughs> oh, well. Uh, prepaid tuition plans, again, not a seven issue. It's more of a five, uh, SIE issue. And it's this idea that you can prepay and then you have inflation protection uh, from uh, the cut rising cost of a college education, right? Inflation is too much money chasing too few goods. In this case, what you're worried about is too much money chasing too few college degrees, right? So this would protect you from that. Um, money market securities, boy, money markets are very testable. So remember I say, when you open an account at a brokerage firm, what do you want to do with your idle cash? You want to put it in a traditional bank account? We have that available for you. Or would you want to put in a money market fund? And you say, well, what's on a money market fund? I say high quality debt maturing in less than 12 months. And we have two versions of a money market. We have a taxable money market fund and we have a tax-free money market fund. You say, what's in a taxable money market fund? Very testable, commercial paper, large unsecured borrowing by corporations issued and traded at a discount. It's important to know that because in a money market fund, they're gonna to have to meet redemption requests, which means they have to be able to sell things, right? Uh, bankers acceptances used to facilitate foreign trade issued at a discount, both commercial paper, bankers acceptances, 270 day max maturity, commercial paper, test question, large unsecured borrowing by corporations. Uh, I'm a shareholder in Schwab and in the Schwab annual report, they said the treasury department of Schwab can issue $2 billion of commercial paper without board approval to fund the daily operations of Schwab. I said, woo, you know, people forget in March, we had a, the money market started seizing up and the Fed had to step in and start buying some of these, uh, you know, secondary commercial papers so these money market funds could meet their redemption requests. T bills in March, nobody wanted even a money market fund; they wanted T bills. Uh, and I say in my tax-free money market fund, we have bands, TANs, and trans. I think of this as the Muni equivalent of borrowing against receivables. You know, Bank of America and J.P. Morgan are underwriters for the state of California on a negotiated basis. And one reason they do that on a negotiated basis is because Bank of America and J.P. Morgan are willing to front hundreds of millions of dollars to California in bond anticipation notes. You know, for example, uh, California sold $4 billion worth of GOs in 2020. And they said to JP Morgan and Bank of America, can we have a $500 million cash advance? And JP Morgan, Bank of America said, certainly here's 500 million. You give a bond anticipation note. You get this from your underwriter. When we raise the money, we'll get back our 500 million, a little interest. You know, uh, the municipality can go to a money market fund manager. They were anticipating some taxes, but we'd like the money now. So they give the money market fund manager a tax anticipation note, get the funds, and then, they, you know, when they get the taxes in house, they get back the money in a little VIG. Tax and revenue anticipation notes. Now, the trick here is that usually notes are two to 10 years, but not in municipals. In municipals, that's less than a year. So, kind of a trick. Now, you know, local government investment pools are kind of like money market funds for cities and counties and school districts where they pool all their money together so that they can go out and get a little something from all this uh, cash. This local government investment pool is going to buy commercial paper, bankers acceptances, uh, treasury bills, negotiable jumbo CDs to try and get those government a little bit, a bit of a return on their idle cash. And again, it works like a money market. They use it, to, you know, to redeem, to pay the salaries of the, you know, firefighters and policemen and city employees and that kind of stuff. Uh, these two got a little wobbly here during the pandemic. Well, you know, in 1933, Senator Glass and his buddy Steve Eagle said, you can't be a bank and a brokerage firm anymore. You can either be a bank or a brokerage firm. You can't be both. And the bank said to Senator Glass, we don't think you've thought this through. If you're telling us if we pick bank, we can't conduct a securities business. He said, that's exactly what I'm telling you. You're going to deny a lot of cities and counties and school districts access to capital markets because, Senator, most of us are picking bank. The only guys picking brokers are the guys in Chicago and New York and San Francisco. And he goes, OK, good point. He says, tell you what, if you pick bank, you don't have to divest yourself of municipal securities. You can continue to do that. And so that part of our business was never separated. Now, I'm dating myself, but between 1933 and 1995, you couldn't be a bank and a broker term. You could either be a bank or a broker term. You couldn't be both. Now, obviously, that's not true anymore. But in 1975, we all got together and said, we got to do something about this market. It's a mess. And Baker said, how, do you, uh, how about you uh, broker types opt into our regulatory framework? We said, no, thanks. We said, how about you opt into uh, our broker dealer uh, regulatory framework? No, thanks. I said, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you keep your guys and we'll keep our guys. 
let's set up a municipal securities rulemaking board. Five bankers, five brokers, five members of the public will allow them to publish rules, but will deny them the enjoyment of enforcement. They have no enforcement power. There's nobody coming in here, MSRB. They publish rules, A rules, administrative rules, D rules, definitional rules, and the rules we're concerned with, general rules, G rules. And who enforces the rules? Well, if you're a bank exclusively conducting a municipal business, as I mentioned, you don't need a broker dealer subsidiary if that's what you want to do. It'd be the same people who always enforce rules on banks, the Federal Reserve Board, the FDIC, and the Comptroller of Currency. Who enforces MSRB rules on broker dealer? The same people that always do. The SEC and FINRA are a self-regulatory organization, right? Let's talk about uh, some of the rules of the MSRB. The MSRB says the customer confirmation, by the way, it's not whose rule it is. These are the same rules of FINRA. So it's not like make a flashcard. It's like know the rules, right? Right. So customer confirmations have to be in the mail by settlement. You know, and that customer confirmation should be the name, the address, the telephone number, a broker, dealer, or bank. The customer's name, whether they bought or sold, a detailed description of the security test question, the QCIP. You don't need to know that that stands for Committee on Uniform Security Identification Procedure, but you do need to know, they'll say on your exam, each security has a unique identifying number known as, and you got to come up with a QCIP. You know, I told you, particularly in municipal, I mean, corporations have QCIPs too, but am I talking about Orange County, Florida, or Orange County, New York, or Orange County, California? You say, Dean, what's the QCIP? Then you and I both know that we're talking about the same thing. The trade date, and the settlement date. Remember, settlement is when ownership changes hands, and the, that's the second business day after the trade date. This teeter totter is the one that's testable. Remember, this is interest rates have gone down, causing the bond to go up. And very testable. That's called the inverse relationship. And the MSRB says that when you sell a bond at a premium, you should quote yield to call because it's not likely the customer is going to yield, yield to maturity. Now, if I choose to be deceptive, I would say, ooh, you know, brand new munis only pay, you know, three. I got one that pays five. And you say, well, Dean, don't I have to pay a premium for that? Should you really be quoting that to me? I think, aren't you supposed to quote me the yield the worst, the lowest yield I could expect, not the highest yield I could expect? I said, well, gee, you're no fun. <laughs> right? So <laughs> this is the one that's Tesla. Now, to give you an example of how they might test you, now the slide I'm about to show you is the most difficult version of this. This is very, you know, high, high up there. But, uh, you know, I want to show you the most nasty kind of a thing that you can encounter. And here it is. Now, what I want to show you uh, based on this is how do you remember interpolate? Remember this from a previous lecture? When given the price, when given the price, how do we figure out or reverse engineer the bond price? Because what we're looking at here is a bond that's at a premium, right? So. Here, this is the nominal yield. It's like learning a foreign language. Five means 5%. The nominal yield, the Q bond, fixed or stated. Basis is the yield of maturity. And so if we make our teeter-totter, our seesaw, right? Here's the 5%, and that's the nominal yield. And here's the yield of maturity, where basis is the fancy word for yield of maturity. And that's 5%, and so this bond is at par. And so that's not a problem because par or discount, remember, we're going to uh, quote, we're going to quote the uh, yield to uh, maturity. All right, let's look at this one. Here's our nominal yield. And our nominal yield here is less than the yield of maturity. And so again, we draw our teeter-totter, our seesaw. And uh, this is four and a half. And this is here, that's 5%. And so this is a bond at a discount. And again, we don't have to quote yield to call. Here we will quote again, yield to maturity. Uh, here is our nominal yield. Here's our yield to maturity. Basis is a fancy word for yield to maturity. There's our teeter-totter. And so here's that, 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 and that. Whoop. And this is three. And this is higher than that. That's a bonded discount. All right, so let's look at our last one. So again, by process of elimination, here's our flat line. Remember, this is nominal yield. This is current yield. This is yield to maturity, and that's yield to call. And here we have a nominal yield 
that is higher than the yield of maturity. So this is 6%. And they're telling me that this the yield of maturity is 5.5%. And so that is a bond at a premium. So we're using our seesaw or teeter-totter to figure out which one of those I have to quote yield to call. By the way, remember why this is Tesla because it's deceptive to tell somebody that bond pays six. You know, to know whether you wanna buy that bond, you need to know yield to call. And if that yield to call is still attractive, then by all means, buy that bond. But you, know, you need to know that before you can make an informed decision. You know, I say to you as a customer, I say, listen, at Merrill Lynch, we are a broker dealer. And in some transactions you do with us at Merrill Lynch, we're going to be acting our broker agency capacity. And on your behalf, we're going to go get the security elsewhere. Again, this is true regardless of whether it's a muni bond we're discussing or any other security. In other transactions you do at Merrill Lynch, we're going to be acting our dealer principal capacity. We'll be charging a markup or markdown. In each and every transaction we do with you, we're going to disclose in what capacity the firm acted. And we will never be a broker and a dealer in the same trade. So you say, hey, Dean, I got my comm firm. I see that Merrill acted as my broker, my agent in this transaction that's on my comm firm. Who did you get the security from? Now, the contraparty is not on the confirmation, but it's available upon request. Now, you're confused if what you call me up and say, hey, Dean, I see it said that Merrill acted as dealer principal capacity. Who's the other side of the trade? Who's the contraparty? So you're a little confused, my friend. You know, crude interest, we said, is uh, added to the price people pay. And we calculate crude interest, remember, from the dated date up to, but not including the settlement date. Now that's gonna be the additional money that the customer who buys the bond owes the seller of the bond. Uh, the day to date, we just talked about that. When they start to accrue interest for the next time frame, where they've been called or pre-refunded, if they're trading X legal over the years, some uh, bonds have lost their legal opinion. X is Latin for without, and so some muni bonds trade without a legal opinion available, and that would have to be disclosed. Now, the MSRB doesn't have a five percent policy; they just say that whatever it is, it should be fair and reasonable. In other words, we should have a normal pattern to our charges. We shouldn't be making it up on the fly about what we're going to charge people. Fair value of the bonds, dollar amount of the trade, availability of securities. You know, thinly traded securities, and God knows there's some thinly traded muni bonds are going to have bigger spreads between the bid and the offer. You know, it's kind of like the car business, right? If I'm a Lamborghini dealer, I probably don't sell or buy many Lamborghinis, but when I do, the spread's going to be huge. If I'm a high Hyundai dealer or Hyundai dealer, you know, I have smaller spreads, but I make it up in volume. The value of my services, you know, maybe I search high and low to find you a bond of the school district that your kid attends. I say, listen, for me to do a really good job for you over time, I need to know a lot about you. The more I know about you, the better I'm gonna be at determining suitability. And you say, well, Dean, it's none of your business. I said, well, no, it is. We have a KYC, know your customer rule. And my regulars say, I can't make recommendations without knowing something about you. I said, how about I read you a list of investment objectives. You rate them on a scale of one to 10, 10 being very important, one not important at all. You know, safety of principal, 10. You know, tax-free uh, income, 10. Liquidity, 10. Maybe I buy you a AAA mini bond fund, for example. Now, usually they're going to test you on recognizing things that would clearly be unsuitable given somebody's investment objectives. Now, I've had a couple requests for a suitability lecture, and I'm working on how to best organize that, and you know, who knows when I'll get that done. She's testing on the 23rd, so obviously I want to get it done in a fashion that gets her some time to actually make use of it, but uh, the more you uh, know products, the better off you're going to be determining suitability. And usually you get to a 50-50 pretty quickly. Now, if you know, you're Bill Gates and you're not going to give me any information, I'm just going to put in suitability, richest man in the world, or maybe Bezos passed him up, I'm going to buy you some mini bonds. If I have other ways of determining suitability, I still can conduct business or I can do business on an unsolicited basis. But what's your tax status? What's your tax bracket? That's important, right? Because the higher your tax bracket, the more sense a muni is going to make. I shouldn't recommend unsuitable trades. And I shouldn't do uh, any churning. Churning our tra uh, trades are excessive in size and frequency. We don't have a hard and fast rule. It's kind of like what the Supreme Court said about pornography. 
And so we don't know it, we have a definition, we just know it when we see it. By the way, that's a, that's a violation regardless of where we're talking about the MSRB rules or FINRA rules or you know, the North American Security Administration, uh, Administrators Association all think that's a bad thing. We used to have a brokerage from Golf Smith Barney. <laughs> they make their, their, their big slogan was, we make money the old fashioned way we earn it. And then their joke in the business was they churn it. <laughs> so. All right, so other rules, G rules or general rules, remember. So here's Gamma Global. Gamma Global is my broker dealer. And uh, maybe I sit on the uh, city council and uh, we're selling the bonds. Michelle, who works for me, you say, do you like the bond? She goes, oh, we love the bonds. You know, uh, the broker dealer, Gamma Global, our managing member, Dean Tenney, sits on the city council and he represents both the issuer and our broker dealer. That's fine. It just needs to be disclosed. By the way, this is true not only of MSRB rules, it's true of FINRA rules. If you're a Merrill broker and you sell Bank of America stock, it'll be on the confirm that there's a control relationship between the issuer, Bank of America, and uh, Merrill Lynch. Right? So control relationships. By the way, your default on the test should everything should be disclosed. Now, I say, hey, listen, I don't want to start over with a new guy. And is there anything I can do to help you get reelected mayor? Because I like doing business with you as a, your municipal financial advisor. Or, and the most you can give test question is 250 per election cycle. But now be careful on this one. This is very testable on the SIE as well. I, you know, I can't tell you how I many times people tell me they see this on the SIE. Uh, you have to be able to vote for the elected officials. So before you can even do anything, you have to be able to vote for the, uh, the elected official. If you can't vote, you can't give them anything. If you can vote for them, then you can give them $250 per election cycle. Make sure you got that. I mean, because it's not 12 months, it's a per election. So every time he's up, I can, you know, give him 250. I already talked about the, this rule about no switching roles, right? Uh, if I'm a Morgan Stanley, the financial advisor to the city of San Francisco, I say, listen, what I think you should do is issue some special tax bonds. They say, well, Dean, uh, you've done such a great job at Morgan Stanley. Uh, can you underwrite the bonds for us? I say, no. The MSRB thinks that it's too much of a conflict of interest for Morgan Stanley to represent the issuer San Francisco, represent Morgan Stanley, and then sell it to Morgan Stanley customers. So I can't switch roles. Now, I can stay as your financial advisor, and as part of being your financial advisor, help you continue to prep your documents, like your preliminary official statement, for example, or your OS, or you know, contact the bond council. And you know, if you're going to do it negotiate, I can negotiate with the underwriter on your behalf, or I can help you evaluate the bids if we decide to go competitive, but I can't switch rules and underwrite the bonds. And then the maximum gift or gratuity that an employee of one member firm can give the employee of another member firm is $100. It doesn't count normal deductible business activities and it doesn't count reminder advertising. Well, remember if I'm at Morgan Stanley in my example, uh, I am in a unique position to refer uh, the city of San Francisco to a underwriter. And you say, hey, Dean, how about I you know, give you, you know, uh, 10 cents on every bond if I get the underwriting to refer them my way? I say, absolutely not. Now, by the way, the FINRA version of this rule is very similar. And as a FINRA rep, remember, you have an approved product list and on your approved product list, there are things you're allowed to get people involved and the people who have those products for you work for a broker dealer, for example, you know, Franklin Templeton fund distributors. And so remember this rule also applies to a wholesaler, the maximum gift or gratuity that a wholesaler, you know, uh, can give to an employee of the broker dealer is again, a hundred bucks. Now, remember that doesn't mean again, that I, my wholesaler can't say, Hey Dean, why'd you invite your prospects and clients to a seminar this evening? Uh, uh, I'll pay for the pizzas, the sodas, the dinner, I'll come talk about professional management, diversification, ease of ownership. That's all fine. That's all fine. That's a normal deductible business activity. Reminder advertising, golf balls, you know, stadium seats, whatever the case may be. That's reminder advertising. Uh, well, we just brought, we went over this rule, did we not? We said activities of financial advisors, uh, broker-dealer issue relationship is disclosed. I gave you the example. Not every story I tell you has a point, but most of them do. And remember, I gave you this MSRB for any BD. In my example, Morgan Stanley, that serves as an advisor to a municipality. In my example, San Francisco, 
on any bond issue from switching roles and underwriting the same issue. There are exceptions, as I mentioned, the uh, Morgan Stanley, my example, can continue to assist in the preparation of documents and evaluating underwriters and evaluating bids. They just can't become an underwriter. All right, well, listen, I keep forgetting to tell you to like, share, and subscribe. So like, share, and subscribe. Uh, the next lecture uh, will be, uh, let's give you, a, uh, the next lecture will be on the uh, Uniform Securities Act. Uh, I'll get that up at some point. Uh, put in your, um, whatever it is you want to have lectures. I know there's a suitability thing. I haven't done that. I haven't done partnerships. I haven't done mutual funds. There's a lot of stuff I haven't done yet. So just put in your request and uh, we'll work our way through it. I'm trying to, first quarter, I kind of took myself off the normal rotation of teaching classes so I can get some more social media stuff up. So that's kind of my goal. I'll see you next time.